ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome you all to the first seminar in the in Spring 2011 Data and Search Informatics Seminar Series. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. <laughs> like dual, dual hats here, but uh, I actually have had, had a number of people that have helped organize this semester's seminar, and Scott is uh, one of those one of those people. So Scott, thank you very much. We've got a, a good lineup of people. Uh, we've got Joel Salz coming from Emory, and um, Kevin Boyer. Uh, pardon? Kevin Boyer from uh, Notre Dame, um, and Kelly from UNC, and Chubbuck from Buffalo. From where? North to Buffalo, right? Yeah. Okay. Closer, yeah. Just they span from library science to uh, distributed computing to uh, well, Kevin is doing more biometrics, so, and Joel Saltz is high-performance computing and and some health informatics work that, that, that he's been doing. He's a medical doctor also at Emory. So, so anyway, so uh, appreciate the appreciate the interest. I'm going to talk on work that we've been doing in, in Providence Collection, and we've characterized this as unmanaged workflows and the system with which we're, we're playing with things is called Karma. This is, this is something that obviously I don't do by myself. It's in collaboration with uh, Roland Ron Chandra, who was at Alabama, who's now at Oak Ridge, and uh, David Lee, Chris Small, who works with the Global Research Network Operations Center at IU, Ben, who is postdoc here, has moved up to Teradata, and Chris Mamet, and then, and then a number of students that, that I'm very grateful for their, for their for dedicated help, and then uh, support through, uh, through funding agencies. This problem we're addressing is a data deluge. This is not a, a, a new term and it's not a new problem to, to many people, but uh, we just have a couple statements here that talk to the, the, the growth in data. And in 2007, we hit a crossover point where we generate more data than we can possibly store. So we're now at a point where, um, where, where, where we have to do something. Much of this data, narrowing in, much of this data is in the sciences, coming not only through, through instruments and sensors that are the, the, the generators of, of, of new data, environmental data, gene sequencing machines which are generating new forms of data, but also climate models. So you might say this is raw data that's coming in real time, but climate models generate uh, kind of you know, integrated results that are, that are interesting to examine. Uh, you know, the ocean floor, we're putting sensors in the ocean floor so that we can model the ocean and do predictive capability in the ocean, but we need the combination of both the both kinds of data, the predictive data and the observational data. The uh, research, the funding agents have, uh, agencies have, have really over the last six to eight months, really, it was probably six months to a year, uh, begun to respond to the recognition of the value of the of data, particularly the National Science Foundation, they've long advocated that if you generate software products from NSF-funded research, that you need to then put that those software products in the in the in the open community for sharing. They're now turning that on to data, and that is actually a harder problem because the the formats are, are so different and, and the access forms are so so different. So they're they're coming out and saying, look, you know, if you've got if, 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 the net, if a funding agent is funding the generation of data, we want that data out there and we want it in a way that it can be shared, not only now, but, but, but in the future. And you know, I've, I've advocated for quite a while that, that when I share, sharing today, if I were to share a data set with Ed, Ed would know something about me. He would know, he would know something about my reputation. He would know something about the context in which this data were generated. But if we separate that relationship, and separate that in space, so I'm dealing with some, or separate through time, that contextual information that defines our relationship, that in a sense allows uh, um, Ed to trust what I've done, that disappears. So that needs to be codified and, and, and accompany the data. And I'll go along with that so that he can determine, have the same levels of trust that he, he might otherwise with a personal relationship. And that's basically what we're, what we're trying to tackle, is how do we codify this, how do we package it up with the data so that the data can be used, shared now, and, and used decades from now. So metadata, which is what we're talking about, is contextual information. Obviously, metadata is broader than that, but, but it's a simple definition for now. It has to be preserved when the scientific data is generated because metadata is ephemeral. And the ephemeral piece is just what I was talking to. It's, the, it's that contextual information that, that 
well, we know the lab is working on this, and you know, we know that was good work, those kinds of things. Fran Berman said that this is that management organization access and preservation of digital data is arguably the grand challenge of the information age. But if the annotation is left to the scientist, it's, it's not done. You know, Scott had done a little bit of research on this in, in his dissertation. Uh, it'll, it'll be done, but it'll be done incompletely or it won't be done at all. And also, the further the distance between the producer and the, and the reuse case, the more detailed the metadata that's required. So where things are changing is we had done a, a report on data management that went out. Uh, I was more internal to the IU campus, but, but it, it very much dealt with these issues. This uh, diagram came out of the Fran Berman and, and a group of people, the Blue Ribbon Task Force, Sustainable Economics for a Digital Planet, uh, talked to the, these issues. But, but if, we, if we remove these two boxes right now, what we used to see is data created, data distributed, data archived. And at that point where you do an archive, there's a preservation action that takes place. And that preservation action tries to capture curation information about the data set so that it can go into long-term access and it can be, and can be accessed by people um, in, 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 you know, that, are, that, are, that are completely separated from the, from the creation piece itself. That's no longer possible because, because of the issue of gathering the metadata that we need, which is only known here. Your scientist is your creator. Your scientist is the one who makes keep or discard decisions. So it can't be, it can't be preservation is done downstream later in the data life cycle. We have to push it into as early in the life cycle as we can. Manual annotation is one solution, but as I just mentioned, that's, a, that, that's an inferior solution. So what we work on in our lab is tools that get, can be applied in the earliest stages of data's life that help with the preservation. And what we're capturing through a number of our, our, our efforts, and a lot of them involving software development, prototype development, is what are the limits of this collection that we can do uh, in a transparent way to the user. So dropping into the specific topic, because we do work both in metadata and provenance, so we're, we're talking specifically about provenance here. So provenance der derives from provenance of works of art. So your provenance of a work of art is a trace of the history of, the, of this uh, piece of art from the moment it was made until it comes into a collection. Key pieces here are that provenance is impartial, it's an authoritative. It talks to the authenticity, the ownership, the theft, less of an issue for us, but, uh, but other artistic, legal, and ethical issues. So drawing from that, data provenance is also the impartial and authoritative information on the lineage of a data object. And where we're trying to go is used to establish trust. I mean, that, that's a research objective right now, and that's certainly not something that we can claim any, any, um, any, um, <laughs> I would say any not deliverables isn't the right word, but any real, really valuable uh, um, um, uh, opinions on right now, anyway. So, what's the lineage of our of our provenance research? It started in the mid 2000s, in mid 2000, and it was uh, the prototype common provenance system, which we're still working with. It worked in the context of the Science Gateway, the lead Science Gateway. It worked with the GBFL workflow system. Uh, and we've since then, uh, Yogesh has since moved on. He went to Microsoft Research for a while, and now he's down at University of Southern California. We've since moved on to address a number of issues, and one of them being the implications of this unmanaged workflows, uh, their implication on, on representation, flexible support for problems creation. I'll talk quite a bit about these two right here. A little bit less on the visualization. That, that's still very early work. Representations of uncertainty, early work and uh, system interoperability, not much work there. But these are the are, are ongoing topics. So it took us a little while to realize this, but there are a number of other uh, groups in the country that are doing provenance capture, provenance representation. And ours seems so hard. <laughs> and it really took us a while to, to really kind of characterize the problem we had staked out. And, and, and now it, it's, it's clear now, but, um, but I think a good analogy is the unmanaged business process. And, and, and you know, so, so workflow execution, uh, basically we borrowed workflows from life, from business. 
uh, which, which basically encode, you know, a human, a human executing a number of steps as a workflow. It's a human, pro, a human workflow. So we thought, wow, great work, computer scientists. We can automate that. <laughs> so we built all these tools. We can, we can, you can, you can use our tools to define your own workflow, build your own workflow, and run your own workflow. We'll do it for you. And, um, and we, we did this for years, and we demonstrated all these demonstrations. Lead was a very successful demonstration of running these workflows. Then we realized, oh my God, where's the human? <laughs> so now we're trying to jam the human into this. So where do we? We got to call out for the human. The human's got to get, you know. <laughs> it's, um, so what the unmanaged, the unmanaged workflow really is, is, is a recognition that you don't have control end to end over this execution, and there are points where the automation fails. Because by golly, there's a human doing something. Um, and what that really means when we're doing capture is, you know, it, you know, if you've got this nice script for what's going to happen, you can you can look at that script and then you can compare it to what you're getting and you can say, does what I'm getting match the script or not? We don't have that benefit. We are just purely collecting and trying to piece things together from an in, from, from 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 no no recipe in advance. And that's the difference, and that's the challenge of the unmanaged workflow. So we accumulate discrete events at runtime during the life of this, this workflow without prior knowledge of the structure of the workflow. So briefly, provenance, I've got another slide that's, I won't describe this, another slide that's simpler to look at. But the provenance is the lineage of a data object or a collection of data objects, and it explains what contributed to the object, object's creation. So very simply, we, we look at, we can look at, this is a book, we, you know, it just opens up as a book, so it's reflective on, so we've got a user, so this is a particular action that took place, there's our user, our user launches a service, service one consumes file one, service one invokes service two, service one produces file two, and you can deduce from that that file one was part of the transformation to file two. So if we look at that in the terminology, and this is the terminology that's expressed in the open provenance model. It's a community, community, I would say standard, it's a loose standard, community agreement for representing provenance, uh, particularly as graphs representing the relationship, the entities and the relationships. So the services, that user is represented as an agent, that service is represented as a process. So the process was controlled by the agent. The process used the artifact. The, pro the artifact was generated by the process. Process two was triggered by process one. So these are the, the essential entities and relationships that are, that are provenance. Are these adequate? No, they're not. In, in many ways, they're not. Uh, people are uh, you know, extending the, the relations. They're pretty well holding to the, the entities, but they're extending the relations. So what is a provenance collection system? So it's a, in its purest form, it's basically, it's a repository that does real-time collection. It actively collects and ingests provenance, provenance events. It stores those using a data model that supports time series data storage, aggregation of events, synthesis of events to form new knowledge, and then it also has an access layer. And I've got a picture that shows what that is. So we have our, an application sitting at the top. We've got four basic layers, a provenance creation layer, a capture layer, representation layer, and an access layer. Events flow from the application. There's a, a connection here that I talk quite a bit about in terms of how you get those two working together. There's two forms in which the events can come in. One of them is a, 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 a message bus. The other one is, this is more asynchronous and this is more synchronous web service calls. The database ingester stores data into the database and then this is where, so this is in real time. And then we've got some post-processing here where we can, we can uh, capture uncertainty, we can, we can examine uh, you know, we can aggregate, we can, again, we've got this is all post-processing kinds of activities, and then an access interface through which the user uh, accesses the system. Let's talk a little bit to interoperability, because this was another issue that we actually, um, that, that distinguished, uh, you know, distinguishes our work from a lot of other work in the community, and, um, you know, interoperability is a, is a, is a very, broad term 
and, and not, you know, it, it's becoming clearer what that means in the context of, of provenance systems, but, but I'm uh, defining three points of interoperability that I think are important. One of them, and these are in reverse order, so one is access interoperability, and basically this is the, whatever, the ease of the burden of third party developers who write tools to retrieve provenance. So I write a tool, I should be able to get, uh, re make requests from your service, make requests from some other service. Interoperability at that level. Interoperability at the representation layer, and this is where repositories will harvest from each other. Or if you're going to do some kind of replication of provenance data, the, do we have a common exchange format? Uh, the OPM language that I, I showed you in a very simple form, the OPM representation, is very suitable for defining provenance in the open access layer, very suitable for defining provenance in the representation for exchange between systems layer. That third point, and this is where we put quite a bit of our attention, is in the capture interoperability. And basically this says I should, between the application and the provenance generator, do we have a, a common format that provenance system support. And here is where there is there is no agreement. The approaches are different. There's no agreement. Maybe we'll, we'll, work, we'll work toward agreement. There's no agreement right now. And, and this is where we've looked at OPM as a, as a we st OPM is the starting point for representing the kinds of information we're trying to collect, but it's, it's insufficient. Uh, you know, this is captures provenance from streaming workflows, supports interoperability, it's kind of yada yada stuff. Okay. Let me give you an example of the provenance capture. So we've got a, a we've got a we've got like a like a little workflow here. We've got an application, a script, a little curl script, something like that. And it's executing three applications. It's a, the application task. It's executing them in order. There's A1, A2, A AM, so there's some number there. It could execute them in any order. And we need to collect provenance from that. We've got our provenance system up here. So we've got a couple different approaches that I'm illustrating here. One is where we put sensors, we actually modify the Perl script or somebody else modifies the Perl script to put the, with the little sensors in. When you hit that point in the logic, you write out a notification or event message. The other one, and that's shown in S1 and A1. The other one is to mine a log file. Or to a, this is shown, we actually have three different forms. So this is to mine a log file. That's the log file that's generated. That gets passed through an adapter, and the adapter can, we've got from a rule based solution to, to parse the, the log files and to generate the provenance. And those are the primary two approaches we've got to provenance capture right now. One, that, that's, a, that's a, you know, an implementation of the sensors. Has, so this is these are tasks. We've got a client task and we've got a server task. And we've got the Karma service sitting at the bottom. Through Access2 allows handlers to be put into the Access2 layer, into the web services layer. And those handlers can then do, do something for the traffic that's going in and out of the application. So this was an attempt to grab provenance without perturbing what's going on at this level. So as things get pushed out, this is kind of the out mechanism for access to, we have our little handler in there. Our handler grabs the message and sends it off to Karma, kind of behind the scenes, and then the message goes its, its own direction. And it can handle, so we've got, you know, they, it goes on, we've got this model as client server, and that, those can, they can happen on both sides. So, the adapter approach, that was the sensor approach. The adapter approach extracts provenance information from a log file using a rule set. This is some work that Devarshi had done. Uh, and generates events and sends them to the Karma service. And the hit graph is, is the way in which we get the, the information out. But so this is this is kind of the space that, that we that we're working in. Mechanisms for collecting provenance have trade-offs. And the trade-offs are going to come in, what's the burden on the application programmer? What's the burden on the human, which would be the, the scientist that might run the application? And then what, you know, what's the impact on error rates and omissions? 
So if we have three approaches. We have a user annotation approach, we have a scavenging approach, and we have a full provenance of instrumentation approach. And let me just let me just start with the user annotation. User annotation says we rely on these scientists to give us all of the information that we need. Okay. No app, no burden on the application because there's no change to the application. There's no modifying the application code. However, the burden on the human is high because we're depending on the scientists to give us what, the information that we need. The implication is the error rates and omissions can be high, leading to incomplete information because they're not, they're not going to give us perfect information. We know that. So that's the one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is full provenance instrumentation. And this is where you modify your application code to invoke our libraries and send our messages. Great, we get complete information. Perfect from our point of view. We love it. <laughs> it's high application burden because you're modifying your application code. Low human burden, but the high developer setup cost, but, but your, your burden on your human is low because once you get it instrumented, we get the information for free. So what we're trying to do is, is characterize the space in between the scavenging space that has a low, and the, and the monitoring the log file, parsing the log file is one of these examples, that is a low application burden, low human burden, but then when we do that, we, 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 we deal with incomplete information because it's scavenging where, where we don't have a picture of the workflow in advance, we don't have uh, perfect use of our, of our instrumentation, so we're, we have to deal with the incomplete information. So this is, this is the space. And this is, you know, like, you know, like it or not, that this is the space. So you know, you're, you're, taking, you're taking your hit somewhere. And that burden's going to sit somewhere. And, and how, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to do low application burden, low human burden, and deal with the incomplete information. And that's the approach we're trying to take. We're, we're working on it. So this is, this is what we've done. And, and this is a little bit wordy a slide, but, but it really... Um, it really exposes quite a bit. We basically have applied this in LEAD. We've applied it in a, a provenance challenge. We've applied it in a NAS application that we're working with, and we've applied it in GINI, which is the networking application that we're working with. And if we look at the LEAD case, is what we started with. Okay, the application publishes SOAP messages, that the, the provenance events, as part of normal activity. We use our access to handlers to transparently grab a copy of the event and send that to Karma. Perfect. However, we're expecting, and this worked in lead because we built the whole system. <laughs> That's the beauty of having control of everything. <laughs> everything sort of works. Okay, so Karma parses the notifications on the server side to extract useful provenance information. But what this is, is it assumes that the basic provenance behavior is present in the message. And that we had that assumption because we were influencing the set, of, the set of events that got sent, the set of notifications that got sent. So these access to handlers work to the extent that the, pro, the, that the what's flowing is good enough, is good. But, but they only work that far. Because otherwise, to get them to work otherwise, it becomes like this, you're using your access to handlers, but the, the notification messages still have to be generated, which creates an obligation on the application. We use one more example. Um, here we've got the log app, the application writes log messages. The Karma adapter parses the log file and generates the notifications. The adapters need to be written to parse the log file. Uh, Devarshi has written this in a, in a rule-based way that gives us some generality. Uh, it probably needs to be uh, more general still. But it also assumes that the core provenance behavior has, has been written to a log. This is a scavenging approach. We've not applied this in enough cases to really know how, you know, it works reasonably well for one of our applications, um, but we're still working with that also. So we had done a performance evaluation. This is work that Mehmet and, and Peng had just recently done and here in the back. Um, we did a couple things. We, we measured the events capture using the event service bus. And then we did events capture using the synchronous web service interface, and we were measuring the latencies and the transport and the ingest. So our, our timing points are shown here. We grab the time and we subtract the time. T1, T2 minus T1 gives us the amount of time spent in Rabbit and Q. T3 minus T2 gives us the message receiver daemon time and so on. How much time do we sit queuing up waiting for 
waiting for the notifications to be processed. And what this shows is, first of all, that rabbit and queue, blues rabbit and queue, that we're actually getting a latency in the in the event service bus, which is interesting. Um, but we're seeing our own latencies at 150 messages per second, which you know isn't isn't competitive in a, in a high performance event service bus, but it's 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 reasonable. Um, we're not optimizing performance. That's not where we put our, our, our focus and our attention. So it's it's not bad. It's workable. It's not embarrassing. Let me put it that way. Which <laughs> <laughs> is good enough. <laughs> All right. In the web services piece of it, and uh, we did you know web services is basically you've got your, your web service layer sitting right here. So your clients on web services, so you've got to try to generate your load. Uh, and they're communicating by HTTP. So there are 10 clients that are distributed to cluster nodes, 10 cluster nodes. Each of those clients is running somewhere between 1 and 40 threads to generate that, that workload. And we're getting actually slightly better, uh, slightly better performance uh, than we were. We were, we were kind of hitting, we were, we were uh, uh, kind of collapsing at 150 events per second, so this did a slightly better performance. Can you describe the echo operation? Uh, so it's, it's uh, basically what we did is a client is sending a message where the service uh, is not doing any processing and sending the message back. Just for us to understand uh, the performance of the third party application server and compare that with the application server running our, our server. So, so this is kind of the baseline, yes, yeah. you see it now. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the echo operation. Okay, and give you a, uh, a use case here. And this is uh, um, and it demonst demonstrates our ongoing work, but, it, but I think it's, it's quite an interesting use case. Uh, we've been working with the Ginny, the network, uh, the planet, the particular planet lab, there's a couple of these, Emulab is one of them. These are these network uh, um, distributed computers. Uh, planet lab has been around for a while. Uh, and we wanted to run an application on planet lab and collect provenance from it. So the notion that that's unique to Planet Lab is this, no, or Jenny as a whole, is this notion of a slice. So you're given a slice, and when you have a slice, you basically have, you can almost look at it as a virtual machine across some thousand nodes. It's, it's, a, it's a static allocation. It's, it doesn't represent your, your execution. It's a static allocation. So we have a slice, and our slice could be over a thousand nodes. What's demonstrated here is that we're running an application, an active application across five of those nodes with multiple tasks here. So we have our slice, we, we deploy a job using something called Gush, which is a shell onto uh, Planet Lab, and it, it will put our executable on each one of the nodes that we pick that are within our slice and run that. And then it, it writes out log information, we capture that log information and store it into so what we decided to do was to run uh, Twister, which is some work that Jerry Fox and, and Judy Chu have worked on. Um, and it, Twister is a form of MapReduce, so it, it, the application that we used is basically almost a graph coloring algorithm where you partition the graph into different chunks, gets evenly partitioned, gets distributed on the set of nodes, and each, each piece is, is colored, and the results come together to form some statistical output. So we thought we would run, that would be the application on which we would run, and we would collect our comments. So the application was this parallel graph search. This breadth first search was the, the approach to, to walking through these graphs. The platform was Planet Lab. The execution manager was this Gini user shell, which was put, what just developed at uh, William and Mary. We were deploying an application to 10 nodes in Planet Lab, and we were using MapReduce, which is you know Twister, with our, our local form of uh, MapReduce, um, and you partition the graph, run BFS on each partition, and join the results. And there's coloring nodes along the way. 
So our provenance strategy was to capture key details about the application and infrastructure on which the application was run and to do so using minimal intrusion. So this is a demonstration of, of how Twister works. So Gush on the left-hand side there, Gush deploys the application and monitors the status. Gush is, is a shell. Uh, so this, it deploys this head node, this Twister head node. The head node then does the data partitioning and the, the, the deployment of pieces onto the, onto the worker nodes. So the head node of BFS application, uh, it's called node zero, and then the actual coloring itself is done in nodes one through 10 of this planet lab slice. And again, we are collecting provenance from GUSH. And the, the okay, so gee, we use GUSH to start the execution on, on each node in the slice. Uh, we launch GUSH, we load each experiment, so there's a start phase, a start map reduce, run BFS, stop map reduce, and then we mine the log files to collect the provenance. And then we get something like this. <laughs> um, and this is this is this is a first pass disaster, actually. <laughs> and we've been working with this. I mean, this is this is this is start, this is run, and this is stop, and then this is pre and then all of this is the interaction. Um, and, and, you know, in retrospect, this is so obvious. <laughs> you know, we looked at it and said, oh, no, no, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that, you know, gosh, it's just the front end, and Twister is actually doing some of that control, some of that deployment control. So there's, it's localized knowledge. There's only so much knowledge we have. By, by collecting provenance only from Gush. But we didn't want to collect provenance from Twister because Twister was our application. So we're working on getting this graph better. We're getting time. We're, we're doing a better representation of our processes because this, this, this has some failures in the way we model the GNE application within the Karma database. So there's some, there's some shortcomings there as well, so I won't go into that. But so what we did to solve our problems, we redefined it. So. <laughs> We shifted to future grid because in future grid, Twister is middleware. See, we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to collect provenance from the application, but we will collect provenance from the middleware. Yes. <laughs> so now we're collecting provenance from Twister, running on future grid, and then we'll have richer provenance. <laughs> now it, it, it's still, it's, it's you know, again, the, uh, the, what we're dealing with is localized knowledge. You know, the, Network is all about, distributed systems are all about localized knowledge. How much knowledge do you have? The assumption we had when we worked in the lead environment, not an assumption, this is what we had built into our system, was pretty much global knowledge. We passed a global context around. We had that global knowledge where we needed it, when we needed it. We're running into these settings, and we don't have that. We have localized knowledge. So we're trying to piece together a story from, from localized knowledge. So, <clears throat> so anyway, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is ongoing work. And we are. We saw some some of the versions of Cytoscape today that are starting to reveal some more. And this is more work that Payne is doing that are revealing more of this information. So Cytoscape is a very nice tool, and we expect to be able to use it. But we, we need some we need some help with our labels too. So <laughs> we're working on it. So provenance capture in the Gush log files is limited by the localization of knowledge. So our our goal our goal all along has been to capture information about the application while keeping the perturbation low. In other words, the intrusion on the application, keep that low, keep the programmer burden low. And you know, and we argue, we solve, we solve this for an environment like Planet Lab, or we solve it for Future Grid. Well, these other environments, Condor, TerraGrid, Emulab, and these are all distributed environments that, that uh, you know, they're all slightly different, but, but they have the same remote execution model. And as far as the visualization, the killer use case for us is, is to be able to look at two rich provenance graphs, one that may have, you know, one that may have had a failure. Uh, our goal basically is to be able to patch up a failure, assign an uncertainty to, you know, if we're going to if we're going to patch a, a graph, we, you know, we want to be able to say this, you know, our, our trust in this particular representation is lower than than it might otherwise be, but to be able to put two graphs in front of people from which they can just visually compare and get an idea of where something may have gone wrong in their, in their, in their algorithm, in their, uh, their execution. And again, sincere so thanks to the, the PhD students who have, have done a lot of the work too on Prince. Thank you. So 
I, the, the question of, of what is, is for the scientist, for example, an observable phenomenon. And I assume in your uh, graph coloring problem that since you are patching things at the end, you don't have complete control, you're coming up with approximations, right? The number of partitions that are made actually influences the final result because you wind up doing different patches if you have to patch two subgraphs or 20 subgraphs together, right? So, um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out from the scientist's point of view what's visible and what's invisible, right? Because it used to be that the perception of the scientist was, well, there's this black box and I dump my data in and I get something out of the far end, right? And, and, and now, now here's a phenomenon where the implementation of that on multiple processes, for example, causes uh, different observable results. So, um, so I think so. There's two pieces, and, and maybe I'm not understanding correctly. But there's there's cap capturing, trying to patch yeah. errors and drop messages. Yeah, right. and then there's the parallelization. So right. when I partition a, a graph and color, it and then assemble the results, you know. That, that, that's got nothing to do with the provenance piece of it. But do, does it affect the, the, the outcome, the coloring yes. outcome? Well, okay, okay, be, because you, you, you seem to be, be, be collecting provenance of, of something that's happening right. inside of, of that application, which you said was the problem, right? right. Yeah, so yeah. Well, yeah, so basically what we're trying to do, okay, so for that, that graph coloring application, there would be an end result that would come out. And that end result, I, I, I would guess, is a summarization of, of what took place. Is that, do you yeah. know? Yeah, OK. So, so that, that becomes then our data object. And our data object has a piece of provenance that tells you how this was run. And, and it, would, it would presumably tell you, it would tell you, that it was executed on 10 nodes on this day. Um, and you know, finish successfully and, and use these inputs. I mean, so that would be a base provenance record for that. Right, and, but, okay. but, but it, I'm trying to figure, again, come back, coming back to the scientist's perspective, where some of, some of that stuff is just extra burden. That is, if you were doing some purely numerical operation and the only impact of doing that on multiple processors was you'd have shorter overall execution. Mm -hmm. right. And the scientists would expect the results to be exactly the same. And therefore, the scientists would say, well, I don't, don't tell me about how many processes it was run on. Yeah. And, but, 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 but here's a situation where the scientists can actually observe a difference in the result because you're doing this kind of stuff in false approximation. We are only doing approximations on on the the, 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 the data and process dependencies. The, 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 the application yeah. is doing approximations, which is which is which is and and, and so the results of the application uh, and, and so again what I'm trying to get at is 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 when do these properties of how the execution happens? Well, let's let's think back to to a long long time ago when there were different, uh, actually, ALUs in machines. Mm -hmm. And a scientist mm -hmm. would, would, would run the same Fortran mm -hmm. program and machine A and machine B and get different results because the floating point arithmetic was different. Mm -hmm. right. And believe me, they got infuriated when this happened. Mm -hmm. right. But, but the, the, the point is that you had to know which machine it was running on. Right. And, 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 and this, okay. this is the kind of thing that I'm thinking about where, where, where you have this internal problem and stuff becoming visible to, to, to the, the uh, scientist, to the user. Yeah, in the case of errors, I think it's useful. One of the arguments for provenance all along has been reproducibility. Reproducibility, so, yeah, right. yeah. So, so if indeed you get different, yes. Yeah. So, so in terms of the the, the way yes. this thing is deployed, yes. If indeed you get different results, you absolutely need to know what that deployment environment was. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. You know, I, I tend, you know, I believe that re, you know reproduce. 
<laughs> reproducibility for computer scientists, reproducing their own work is about, the reproducibility duration is about three months. <laughs> this is us with our own work, yeah. So reproducibility by someone else five years from now with a complex distributed system, there's just no way. But anyway, but people, people do argue for that. They argue reproducibility. So I argue some form of reproducibility, but it's not getting service X, Y, and Z up and going with you know, archaic version axis, you know, 0 0.2.5, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's a nightmare, but, but no, so yes, to the extent that the, the underlying infrastructure affects the output, then, then that becomes critical knowledge, I think that's an excellent point. That should be easily addressed by you going to the middleware level, though, right? Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's still this, this question of, you know, something's going to happen maybe inside that, that black box, and, and you don't know what it's going to be. I mean, but believe me, you know, I, I mentioned this thing about, about floating point for the scientists, right? I, I remember seeing things, and, and the occasion was, wasn't changing the machine, somebody got a, re-implemented the trigonometric functions on some machine, and they were, they were more accurate. And some scientists just blew up because his results didn't reproduce. Yeah, so we do have, um, we have some work right now where we're grabbing some of the, in the Gini platform, we're grabbing some of the instrumentation, the machine level in information but, to, to attach it. So but, we'll, but, we'll have more stuff. But it becomes very hard because most of the time that's just extra garbage. You don't want to keep that stuff around. You know, we've actually, we've talked about, yeah, it is, but, but, you know, going back to the, the preservation, we need to preserve. The National Science Foundation is demanding that that data be shared. In order for data to be shared, it needs to be discoverable. Um, it needs to be accessible, and that's going to mandate some some collection of attributes about it. And I think two of these tools are are, are at least a way to start to assemble that that record. But but I I, I think the other point of the observation, and may, maybe this this is something that's almost a specifically kind of focus theoretical foundation that we look at is that it's it's the approximateness of these things. If if you're guaranteed exact arithmetic, for example, this no one my my example goes away, right? This example of graph coloring, right? And and, and so it's only when you have to worry about approximations and uncertainty that you have this problem. And that makes it, yeah, that makes it interesting. I would say provenance yeah. is probably yeah. totally dependent no, no, on the no, case. No, 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 but this particular aspect of, of you know, so it, it's kind of uncertainty of what happens inside the black box. If the black box is absolutely perfect and certain, then, then you don't need to, to have provenance information. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's some... Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay. Any other questions? Jeffrey? So maybe I can make some historical comments. So 30 years ago I was a physicist doing experiments at Birmingham. So I took lots of data which is totally, totally never can be reproduced because that particular energy range they may no longer have accelerators. And so let's think what happened to that data. So the actual physical data was on the chip store at the Lawrence Berkeley lab and nine track tapes at Caltech. Both of those were discarded because I had Forgotten about it. The actual data, the data, the data, the data was actually kept by Caltech when we were a fancy project. Got discarded by Caltech. The, the electronic data. Mm. The data that survived was the data I kept mm. when I was in charge of the project, and I stuck the, 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 the results in my um, boxes, which I shipped around the world as I moved <laughs> around. And so nowadays, that's all that remains of that experiment: the published papers and the reports, the technical reports describing the, the information which I kept. The yeah. university did not keep this information, it discarded it. And so did the, the, the DOE laboratory. And yeah, so one of the points in, in, in class today, Andrew, we'll talk about this, one of the papers we're reading in class tonight, talks about the, uh, you know, papers are no longer the medium for collecting data because Generally, they're just a, a summary or, or, or you know summary results, statistical results of, of the data that is significantly larger underneath. So yeah, so uh, you know, those are those are no longer adequate. But that's interesting, you know. So the universities are basically taking on you know and, and 
you know, who's, who's going to be a repository for these data management plans for the National Science Foundation? Well, this data management report that we did, and Stacy was on it, and Robert McDonald was on it, and, you know, Kurt Secret was on it, we had a number of people on it, and David was on it also. You know, we looked at, you know, what it takes to, to you know, we, we have a mass store system, but, but really what does it take to do, to do at least the minimal collection, and, and who in our digital library team can, you know, who can answer the questions, and so we have a, we have a, a, a we have a process with a lot of holes in it right now, and we took some of our data in our lab and tried to push it through that that process of submitting scientific data. You know, we know where those holes are. So, you know, IU you could argue is probably better better uh, situated to accommodate addressing the needs of its scientists in terms of long term management of its data. But it needs to. The report right now is hung on on vice president. But as I know, in one <laughs> case, <his> desk. <laughs> the things I trusted the university were discarded 10 that's, to 20 years later. Yeah, that, that's Whereas that's I cared, I actually kept yeah, the information. That, that's interesting. That's and the same is actually true about the history of parallel computing. All the early work done by my group on parallel computing at Caltech, the first two years I had, because I kept it. Oh. The next years were kept administratively at Caltech in some project in this thing and they were all discarded. So there we go. So we need that little portal. So you need, but you need <laughs> to get, system. <laughs> but you need to get these people really to commit to doing it because it is, it is true that I cared about this. Mm -hmm. and so I kept it. I'm not quite so certain the universities really care. So that in the future they will keep it. So I, I, I happen to, um, I was in a meeting where uh, our president was talking, and, and some people were concerned about cloud computing. And well, you know, they saw they saw cloud storage as a threat to to the university, actually. And and um, President McGraw's response was kind of interesting. He said, basically, you know, you know, and this is this is where our libraries come in. I and mean, we get engagement with our libraries. I'm pointing at you, Stacy. I guess you know, <laughs> we've had some association with our libraries, but but our libraries are committed to the scholarly record. So if we can if we can if we can get scientific data sufficiently imbued in that scholar in, in, in the acceptance of, of the, the the library the libraries fully embrace it as something they need to take care of and it's it's cast in a way captured in a way that they, that they can deal with it I think I think the university has a hope and that was McRobbie's argument you know he said you know 30 years from now you know the likes of, of Amazon who knows what that's going to be like and you know Microsoft or, you know who, who knows what that's going to be like. But your universities, you can count on to continue to be there and to continue to preserve that scholarly record because that's their mission. I mean, so that was that was his argument. So maybe, maybe, maybe the the mode the in the direction right now, the digital libraries community is very very engaged in this problem. They they fully understand it, the scientific preservation. So maybe we'll we'll get we'll get some progress that that that's lasting that we can count on. That, that's my opinion. Going back to your original motivation of the user trying to, to lighten the burden on the user, what you're doing can answer all the interrogatives, who, what, where, when, but not why. That's something that requires the, the uh, user to do. And, and, and so my question is, is there any hope there to, 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 to try and so when, when, when the user I, and I'm thinking again, a scientist who has, you know, three different analysis suites that that that, that she can use. Right. And why does she use choose to, to, to run the data through the second? Right. And, and that and that is very very important. And, and I just I despair about being able to do that. Which is which is kind of funny because. When she was writing that in a green quadrille notebook, she would actually put that down. Why don't they put it in their thesis? But again, if I look at the data which I took, that was kept. The only real place that the detail was put was in the student's thesis. Right, but 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 even even the thesis is, is too late because you 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 have you have to to gather that information as it happens. Right. Well, in, in, in terms of this problem system, and, and, and you know, again, this is, you know, how do you, and it's a matter of, of, of training people. To do what? Well, to, to, to put that stuff in there, right, to, to, to keep 
and, and, and again, as, as I said, you know, typically the scientists are trained to write the stuff down in the lab. Yeah. So I actually gave a talk at, at Oregon State uh, actually Monday, and um, I was talking to a guy who comes out of the programming language, Martin Yu, who was my host, he comes out of programming languages, and he knows Dan Friedman, and he said, he said, you need to, he said, you need to put it as a, an, an, an input to the, this kind of thing, you know, you have a problem, so you need to put it as an input because then you can develop a type system around it and you can ensure that you get the information that you need. No, it's interesting. So the Y can be the input and we can do what he said. You can, you can, you know, you run your compiler on it, you can see if it's, if it's plausible, you know, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. <laughs> Practical, I'm not so sure, but that was interesting. So anyway, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.